Dubbed as a band that played initially moody and a stormy brand of rock music, Concrete Blonde were labeled as the heir to the Los Angeles band X as being the city's next official underground band. They would sometimes shed a light even on the darker subject matter of the city of Los Angeles. Concrete Blonde would go from being underground darlings to having mainstream success in just a few short years. But along the way, the band went through a lot of turmoil, bankruptcy, issues with management and the record label, and of course internal problems. The story of the band began in 1980 when frontwoman Jeanette Napolitano and guitarist James Mankey met while working at songwriter Leon Russell's studio in Los Angeles. Napolitano was working as what she referred to as a gopher secretary person doing errands for the producer. She actually got the gig after meeting somebody at a party who was actually doing woodworking at the producer's studio. A lot of famous people came and went through the studio and Napolitano would admit to the Sacramento Bee that she once spent an entire night rolling joints for Leon Russell and Willie Nelson. Napolitano, for her part, would be described as spin as the girl who handed you eyeliner at a germ show and the type of girl who every woman wants to confide in and guys respect. She would joke to the magazine that her bad relationships were made up of boyfriends which could stretch around the block and that at one point in her life she should have just had the words lie to me tattooed on her. Napolitano would grow up in Hollywood with her father being a pool cleaner for major celebrities including Elvis Presley and Liberace. Meanwhile, Bella Lugosi even babysat her when she was a kid. As she got older, her family would move to the valley and at the age of nine, her dad once took a piano as a form of payment for a pool job he did and gave it to his daughter. In addition to learning piano, Napolitano also learned to play guitar and wrote her first song at age 12 for her baby sister. It would be an aunt of hers who worked in Hollywood as a dancer at the club Shindig and was dating Mickey Dolans of the Monkees and it was that type of lifestyle that piqued her interest in show business. Meanwhile, guitarist James Mankey would play in the 70s era group Sparks with his brother Earl. He also spent some time as an engineer technician for radio DJ Casey Kasem. After working for Leon Russell for a few years, the songwriter ended up moving out of LA and headed off to Nashville, but Napolitano and Mankey didn't follow him. Instead, the pair opted to stay in Los Angeles and work on music together at a 16-track recording studio in Thousand Oaks. It would be a local fanzine named DIY that picked up one of the pair's tracks, a song named Heart Attack, that was put out on a compilation LP that came out in 1982. At the time, the pair of musicians called themselves the Dreamers and they decided that they should find a bass player and a drummer and start playing clubs around LA. But they struggled to get much attention initially because they really couldn't be pigeonholed into a particular scene in Los Angeles. Fast forward to 1984 and the pair were now playing under the moniker Dream 6 and they were playing a lot of post-punk clubs in LA. The band would put out a self-titled EP on a French label which got much critical praise and quickly attracted label attention. The pair soon recorded what would be Concrete Blonde's self-titled record with their own money costing about $15,000. But the pair's friends told them that they might want to act sooner rather than later on nabbing a major recording contract since the opportunity may not present itself again. Well, they did the complete opposite, rejecting any label that tried to make them compromise on their sound. The band nearly nabbed a recording deal with Columbia Records and almost worked with Bangles and Fishbone producer David Kahn, but he insisted on bringing outside musicians in and also wanted to co-write songs with them, which they said no to. Soon enough, Elektra Records almost signed the band with Big Shot producer Michael Wagner set to produce, but the label asked the band to do a CCR cover and they said no. Concrete Blonde finally decided to go the independent route and hooked up with Miles Copeland III, who was running a label named IRS Records. The only suggestion he had was that they change their moniker since there was already a lot of bands with the word Dream in their name. There was Dream Syndicate, Dream Academy, and Dream So Real. So they adopted the name Concrete Blonde, which was actually suggested by a label mate of theirs, REM's Michael Stipe. The band underwent a lineup change during this time as their original drummer left for the security of a normal day job becoming a telephone operator, and they soon enlisted Chicago native Harry Rushikov, who had actually came to LA initially to play with Alice Cooper, according to the Sun Sentinel. The band's self-titled debut album would be produced by Mankey's brother Earl, and it would be put out in 1986. The band's trials and tribulations would be captured on the opening track, True, 
taking a shot at those, trying to change and mold the band into something more commercial. Meanwhile, tracks like Songs for Kim would paint a picture of one of Los Angeles' casualties of the music scene. The band's sound, though, was hard to pin down, ranging from punk to folk to rock. Some would even lump them in with the psychedelic underground movement, but Mankey rejected this despite wearing tie-dyed shirts in the band's early press photos. Meanwhile, others compared Napolitano's voice to Chrissy Hind, Pat Benatar, Stevie Nicks. The album got noticed by College Radio, Radio, who took a notice to the songs like Dylan Hollywood as well as True. While the debut album got much praise and was hailed as one of the year's best records, and the band even got labeled as being the next big thing, it wasn't a huge commercial success, but they had some modest sales with about 100,000 copies being sold worldwide, with about 60% of those coming in the States. The band also nabbed some high profile touring spots, playing with the Smithereens as well as Cyndi Lauper and Eddie Money. But the band, in a surprising move, would declare bankruptcy following the tour for their first record in October of 87. Despite being on the music scene in LA for years up until this point, they weren't really business savvy and they didn't have a business manager when they signed with IRS Records. The contract with the label Saw Concrete Blonde signed a multi-album deal and they only got an advance of $5,000. The band, as part of their deal, gave up their publishing and merchandising rights and the members are pretty vocal about how awful the deal was in the press. It was following the tour for the first album, the band would return home and they were flat broke. The band tried to work with their label to turn their fortunes around, but negotiations fell apart and at the insistence of the band's manager, they declared bankruptcy. IRS, however, challenged the legitimacy of this move, claiming it was just a tactic to get a new record deal from a different company. Concrete Blonde, in a last ditch attempt, would actually renegotiate with their label and come up with more favorable terms with the lawsuits being settled out of court in January of 1989. The group would return with their second album, 1989's Free, and enlisted a bass player, Alan Blotch, to free Napolitano of those duties. The song God is a Bullet angered some folks on MTV who wanted a new video for the song, but the band refused to cut one, so the network stopped playing it. The song would be a commentary on rising gun violence in Los Angeles, something which Napolitano nearly became a victim of herself. The track would peak at number 15 on the charts. The band also included a cover of a Thin Lizzy song, It's Only Money, and it would be pretty fitting considering what the past two years had seen the band go through. Napolitano by this point had enough of LA being disillusioned with Tinseltown's blending of both art and commerce, opting to now relocate to London. It was prior to the recording of their third record, 1990's Bloodletting, that the band fired their bassist and Harry Rushikoff, enlisting former Roxy music drummer Paul Thompson. Napolitano, for her part, would resume her duties on bass, and the band just felt tighter as a three-piece, according to the members. Bloodletting would be a much darker album, with song titles such as The Skies of the Poisonous Garden and Darkening of the Light, a song which saw Peter Buck of R.E.M. actually make an appearance. The last several years of bad relationships, bad business dealings, soured Napolitano on trusting people, but also not helping was her excessive drinking. Despite still being with IRS Records and having a new deal, the band's relationship with their label still proved to be contentious as the label wasn't happy with the first version of Bloodletting, insisting the band record another half a dozen tracks, but Concrete Blonde refused and instead the album was just remixed. The record would go on to become Concrete Blonde's most commercially successful of their career thanks to the number one hit single Joey, and they'd have another hit single in the song Caroline. Joey would be based on a real relationship Napolitano had with an alcoholic lover. The album also contained the controversial track Tomorrow Wendy, that dealt with a woman who had a hard life doing prostitution and drugs only to come down with AIDS and take her own life. The subject matter angered some radio programmers who refused to play the song, with some listeners calling the song un-American. Napolitano would also admit to one paper that the band had received several death threats due to the song. Bloodletting would go gold selling half a million copies. But despite the success, the band seemed to be teetering on the edge by this point. The group was on the road with Sting and despite having a great opportunity like this, Napolitano told Mankey one day that she was done with the group. Bloodletting had largely been inspired by a pretty horrible relationship Napolitano had gone through, and she would tell the Sydney Morning Herald, it was just ironic that bloodletting did as well as it did. When the material was like undressing and standing in front of the whole world, it was a hard combination of me dealing with the material on the record and then having it become so successful. It really shook me up. I feel like I didn't have any control over my life. Mankey, meanwhile, would tell the LA Times, you can't work with Jeanette without butting heads occasionally. You've got to expect that and not take it personally when she starts yelling or something. It's just the way she talks, basically. She's not a diplomat. While Concrete Blonde would remain together for the time being, Napolitano soon ventured into other territory, including directing music videos and painting, and she even opened an art gallery called The Lucky Nun. Ahead of releasing the group's fourth record, 1992's Walking in London, 
Napolitano nearly died due to salmonella poisoning during a trip in Mexico. It would change her outlook on life, making her less angry, and it resulted in a more happy record their fourth album, Walking in London. The opening number, Ghost of a Texas Ladies Man, would actually be inspired by a real spiritual encounter Napolitano had while on the road with Sting at the Driscoll Hotel in Austin, Texas. The band would return in 1993 with Mexican Moon, an album that was mostly recorded before the Los Angeles riots happened, but the subject matter was equally relevant. Mankey would tell the Belleville News, anybody who lived there should have been able to see all the problems coming. The band would take a break in early 1994 as Napolitano worked on other musical projects, and despite Concrete Blonde being on hiatus, Mankey and Napolitano started writing music by the mid-90s with the group Los Illegals, and that project would be released in 1997 with most of the songs being done in Spanish. The band would release several more records with 2002's Group Therapy and 2004's Mojave. Then in 2006, fans were shocked when Napolitano announced that the band was retiring, but then they returned in 2012 with a few new songs and did some shows together. The band hasn't done any shows in over a decade, but Napolitano continues to work in music, composing for films and TV, and works as a gallery artist, and she also looks after rescued horses. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you have suggestions for future topics you'd like to see me cover, use the link in the description box below. And we'll see you again in Rock and Roll Your Story Sticker.